In 1978, the Hogg family of Reddish in the UK experienced some strange goings on. Mandy, Stephen Hogg's girlfriend, would often say over at the house, and on one particular morning, she woke to find she couldn't move. It was as if something had taken over her body. Mandy started to panic as she struggled to open her eyes, but she simply couldn't. She calmed for a few seconds, realizing that someone was most definitely sat at the bottom of her bed. She felt unnerved at the thought of someone sat there watching her. Then, she suddenly felt the bedclothes tighten even more around her. Someone, or something, was holding her down and running its fingers through her hair. Then suddenly, the bedclothes released, and at that point she found that she could open her eyes and move. She immediately glanced around the room, but no one was there. Mandy was so upset about her experience, she confided in her boyfriend Steve, who pretty much shrugged the whole episode off. A few days later, it was all forgotten with. Well, a number of weeks later, Steve and Mandy had decided to save up for their own house. They slowly started to buy household items and store it in the front bedroom, the very same bedroom where Mandy had had that unusual experience. In the morning of September the 3rd, 1978, Steve woke suddenly from sleep to see a figure stood by the wardrobe. Steve blinked and tried to focus, but it had now disappeared. Steve was adamant that he had seen the solid-looking figure. It was there for only a second, but he had seen it nonetheless. Steve described the figure as grey in colour. In fact, it was all grey, even the colour of its skin. It also had the appearance of a man that was looking across the room at him. Steve's father Bernard had also experienced something odd. He had been interested in natural history for many years and had purchased a number of items from local fairs. One such item was that of a real skull. Bernard was very fond of the skull and often showed it to friends, giving them a bit of a fright. Bernard had decided to make a stand for it and sometime later he placed the skull on its stand and stood it on the windowsill in the front bedroom. Again, the very same room Mandy and Steve had experienced something strange. The following afternoon, Bernard had gone upstairs to get the skull. He had planned on taking it into work to show some of his workmates. But when he opened the bedroom door, he was shocked to find the skull missing. The stand, which was still sat on the windowsill, looked to have not been moved, yet the skull was nowhere to be seen. At first, Bernard thought someone must be playing a joke on him. He asked everyone in the family, but they were adamant they had not moved it. The following day, he came in from work, and as he headed to the bathroom to clean up, he glanced into the front bedroom and there it was. The skull was back, sat on top of its stand as if it had never disappeared in the first place. It wasn't long afterwards that the Hogg family moved on. Steve and Mandy had got their own place, and Bernard had moved to be closer to them. The house was then left for a number of months before Amanda Thomas and her two daughters, Melanie and Jennifer, moved in. It's pretty unclear as to why Amanda and her daughters only lived in the house for several weeks. Some of the local residents claim that Amanda had experienced paranormal phenomena and that she fled the house one particular night after seeing the apparition of a man walking about the property. An attempt to locate Amanda came up blank. The local residents believed the house to be haunted, but most of them had known the Hogg family reasonably well, and rumours of their experiences may have circulated. Were Amanda and her daughters forced from their home by paranormal happenings? In August of 1996, the scientific establishment of parapsychology was surprised to receive a letter from someone claiming to live in the very same property. The letter was a detailed account in regards to the witnessing of paranormal phenomena. The new resident, Simon Walker, had lived at this four-bedroom house for a number of years and had much to tell. He recalled his first experience. One of the first things I became aware of was that the small room at the back of the house was kept for the youngest members of the family. There was a cot in there, and one by one, the three youngest of my brothers, Andrew, Chris, and Alan, slept there. During the night, no matter which of them was in there, they would often wake up laughing and giggling. When my mother or father walked into the room, they would immediately stop. It was as if they were being tickled or played with. 
About a week or so later, strange things could be heard during the night. Something could regularly be heard walking up and down the stairs. On investigation in the morning, we often found that things had been moved. My sister Jane, one year younger than I, was stood in front of the fire when she said to me, get your cold hands off my back. I was nowhere near her at the time. When she turned, she realized. She looked puzzled and ran up to her bedroom. Such things happened regularly, and when I asked, I was told, there's nothing to hear that can harm us. The following night was not much better. Again, strange banging sounds could be heard downstairs. I remember lying in my bed, listening to the racket. Then all of a sudden, quietness befell the house. Just when you thought it had ceased for the night, my bedroom door flung violently open and there was a huge flash of light. It seemed to look like lightning as if it streaked across the top of my door and ceiling. At the same time, my built-in wardrobe, which had a padlocked top cupboard, burst open. When I checked it, you could clearly see that the small padlock had been broken off and the wood around the edge was damaged. It seemed as if something had been inside and kicked it open. By this time, I was getting scared. My sister Jane, now 33 years old, had a baby boy, which she named Craig. More recently, my father and Craig's father Gary were in the back garden. Craig was looking up at a small room window and was pointing. He said, who's that man up there trying to get out? There was no one there. Yet, there is absolutely no doubt that Craig could see someone and started to get upset. Craig carried on shouting, get him out, daddy, he can't get out. Eventually, they managed to calm Craig down. Gary even ran upstairs to check the room out. Again, there was no one there. My mother died in 1985, and things seemed to settle down for a while. Eventually, my father picked himself up and decided to redecorate the bathroom. He had purchased some bathroom tiles and was dressing the wall. At the end of the day, after mopping the bathroom floor, he went downstairs for a cup of tea and a smoke. Then, all of a sudden, there was a tremendous crash from upstairs. My father ran up to investigate and found a couple of broken tiles on the bathroom floor. They must have come from out of the bucket he kept the broken tiles in. They must have flung themselves out of the bucket and into the open bathroom door, as there was clearly an impact mark on the edge of the door. A few months passed without any incidents, and my father thought that these strange happenings had come to an end. He was wrong. A couple of years ago, I decided after reading a book on the paranormal to try to find something out about the area, so I visited our main library. After explaining everything to a librarian, she said that possibly the best she would be able to come up with would be something about the history of Reddish. She soon returned with a number of books. However, the only thing that I found was a mention to previous activity in the house I grew up in. It would seem things have been going on at that house for quite a long time. Taking into consideration the amount of information SCP investigators had obtained, they decided to call on the residents now living at the property. They had met at the location and walked up the path and knocked on the door. The door opened and there stood a woman in her mid-thirties. They explained who they were and that they were conducting some research in regards to paranormal disturbances. Before they could get all their words out, she said, Oh God, how did you know? She went on to tell them that she had been having strange things happen for quite some time. She asked them in and she explained in more depth over a cup of coffee. Janet claimed that on a number of occasions she had witnessed an apparition of a man she could only describe as cloaked and wearing a top hat. On all occasions, the figure was seen at the top of the stairs. Investigators asked whether she had experienced anything in the small bedroom. She stared at them for a moment before launching into a detailed account of disturbances that would leave them terrified of the small bedroom. We have all heard strange sounds coming from that room and none of us like to go in there. My youngest son told me that he saw a floating ball of light move towards the small room door and disappear through it. We just stay out of there. It has an uneasy feeling. They asked her to keep a diary of events for them and that they would contact her regularly for the next month or two to see how things would go. 
In the meantime, they would have someone look into the background of the house to see if anything unusual may have taken place there. An examination of the earliest available facsimile maps shows that there was nothing built there between 1892 and 1948. The location was only named in 1949. There was no evidence of any older road or any construction at all on the same site prior to this date. Deductions based on the voters list show that the road was built between October 1948 and June 1949. The even numbers were built first and were occupied during 1949. The odd numbers, including Janet's house, were finished by November 1950. The first occupants of the house were the Lamont family. SCP investigators visited the local church and talked with the vicar who knew nothing of the family's disturbances. He was helpful and offered to talk with Janet. Over the next two months, investigators talked with Janet on several occasions and told her that the local vicar was happy to talk with her about her problems in the house. However, Janet said that no other incidents had taken place since they last talked and was reluctant to have the vicar in her home in fear of the paranormal retaliating. As time passed and the absence of paranormal disturbances increased, SEP informed Janet that she no longer needed to diary any events and gave her their contact details. Unsure as to the phenomena really stopping or Janet just saying so, SEP closed the case. Since then, they have had no further reports, but often wonder if the mystery figure and the audible disturbances will return once someone else moves into that house. To date, SCP investigators have been involved in over 60 traumatic cases of paranormal disturbances. The likes of are yet to be written about.